testing models. Uh, this is primarily being done by uh, Jimmy and Ellie Gearmaid and, and Jesus Molina Harada. End-to-end uh, -end models, which is new. If you noticed on my introductory slide, I had NPRB's logo on it too. They are providing a considerable amount of money to look at, develop new models for use in forecasting where we're actually, this is a couple biophysical model that goes uh, from physics to humans. And uh, management strategy evaluations and set, several of Andre's students are helping us to develop that. Teresa Mar is the most recent recipient of her PhD. And of course, the old standard ECOSYN. But what I'm going to talk about is a little different than either, any of those, and that is a tool that was developed by Chang Zhang for Korean assessments. And it is a synthetic tool that allows you to look at all of these ecosystem indicators. And right now we're using it in the example I'm going to give you now. I, I, we used it in a retrospective look to say how things have changed with the new implementation of, of changes in policy within the Alaska system. The long-term goal is to turn this into a forecasting tool where you can look at it over time. The idea here is to develop risk scores for different elements of the fishery and integrate those in a comprehensive way so you can track the performance of the fishery relative to the policies that the um, council has set forth. And it's relatively easy because you're using ecosystem indicators at this point. So yeah, I'll give you an example. So what we thought we would do, they would. A lot has changed since 1997. We've had a decade of, of pretty major changes in the Alaska system. The first one was the implementation of the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Management and Conservation Act, or Conservation and Management Act. And that, allowed, that introduced that high-risk control rule that I showed you earlier with the, the buffer between the ABC and the OFL and the sloping control rule when stocks were declining major piece of constraint. The other piece was the adoption of the American Fisheries Act, which allowed, okay, so I have five <laughs> minutes, right? Okay, I'm almost there. Uh, uh, that allowed you to have the uh, uh, implement cooperatives. So all of a sudden now the fisheries began to operate in a much different manner. The race for fish was alleviated. And of course the suite of stellar sea lion protection measures. So the idea was to look at how those have changed. So what this technique does is we're looking at the sustainability, the habitat, the biodiversity, and the socioeconomics. We selected indicators for each of these, and we then aggregate these into one statement about how these four elements or goals uh, have, have changed over time. So in terms of sustainability, what you can imagine the big ones are your bio, just what I showed you in that control rule summary slide. Uh, where are your fisheries relative to a biomass reference point? Where are your fisheries relative to catch targets or OFLs? And the age of first capture here is just an idea of looking at whether or not the fishery as it's prosecuted is most efficient. I mean, if you're catching them very young, you might be, a, be de, you might have a less efficient uh, fishery than if you caught them at an older age. For habitat, we looked at the critical habit damage rates. So we looked comprehensively at the hour uh, number of acres trawled within the Bering Sea. And we looked at the amount of the area that's set aside and prohibited from trawling. Uh, in terms of biodiversity, we looked at the discount rate, the mean trophic level of catch, and the diversity index. And of course, we looked at catch per the CPUE and the price per pound and the average wage for uh, economics. And this gives you an idea of then what the process is. The idea then is for an ecosystem, the Bering Sea, and for a fishery, let's say trawl fisheries, and for a species, say pollock, you can then look at where, how that particular fishery is acting in terms of its footprint to sustainability, to biodiversity, its impact on the habitat, and its economics. You can aggregate those up then over a, 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 this different um, 
species, and you can look at the, aggregate those even further over, say, trawl fisheries, and then aggregate them in aggregate or to an ecosystem. And so this, uh, how do you do that? Well, you do that through essentially setting up targets. Right now we have three categories. We have uh, your, your biomass, in this case, this is an easy example, and it's a little harder with habitat or biodiversity, but we essentially set up targets we set up an area in between that is essentially a risk, and then if you're below the limit, so you have a score that ranges from zero to two. We, you aggregate all those up and look at how the performance looks, and I'm going to give you an example. This is where we looked at, then this is preliminary, we're still arguing over what those risk scores and weights should be, but it just gives you what our first out of the box look is. This is, it looks like, in aggregate, all of those changes in our management actually did have the desirable outcome of providing a, a more conservative solution to uh, management in Alaska, which is, of course, what we were hoping would come out. Um, we're as I, I wouldn't say we're done yet. We'll probably publish this paper sometime, or submit this paper for publication sometime this fall. So what have I gone over? Well, uh, the, there are only three more slides. Um, <laughs> uh, first, our policy aligns well with uh, global ideas on how ecosystem-based management should look. Um, we're our principles are, are met similar to those around the world. We do that through a complex suite of constraints that make not, even though our quotas are set on an individual species level, the management of them is far from being single species. They have, they're precautionary in general. Those sloping control rules and the buffer between ADC and OFL really seem to be working to keep most of our stocks in that um, desirable area of not overfished and not overfishing. And, um, but the main thing we need are predictive tools to account for the interactions on how these tools ripple through the system. And that's really what, where we're going with this ecosystem assessment tool that I described. That I frame this ecosystem tool that I gave you a brief overview of, actually does that. It synth synthesizes a variety of indicators into something a manager can understand. It also identifies the key gaps in knowledge. I mean, Jennifer and I, have struggled over, well, how do we do this? What risk score should we put on there? There are a lot of questions that come out of just trying to do this that you wouldn't have had had you not given it a try. Uh, some of the drawbacks of them are that risk scores are common, are currently scaled to a common scoring system. And it may be that habitat shouldn't be given the same weight as sustainability and those sorts of things. That's a public discussion, but at least we can get it out there. Um, and the other piece is that that result that you saw, which looked like the whole system seems to be in better shape now than it was in 97, may be a product of things that were other than the fishery, like climate, that sort of thing. And so, uh, and then of course our weights are currently subjective and we may, they may differ by user groups, but that's what this tool is good for. It allows the user groups to weigh in and say, well, I put more weight on this one. You could have multiple iterations of this. And so this is just a preliminary result, and, but it gives you an idea of a tool that we might be able to bring forward. Uh, in the future, the idea would be to uh, run this in forecasting mode rather than retrospective mode. And what would that take? That would require that we link this with, Jimmy and Ellie currently has a technical interactions model that deals with how the surface of our quotas would go forward. Uh, what, in order to do, move that to an iframe system, we would have to add in uh, things like habitat impacts and the economics to it. And I'll stop. It sort of relates back to uh, one of the figures Jake showed of, of uh, the 
essentially a limit reference point. Your iFame system is taking weighted averages. And I, I don't like weighted averages. And I'll give you an example why. Um, I'm not a very nice person. So I, I'm a cheap tipper when I go out to, to restaurants. I tip 15%. Right. Okay? Um, and I, I, I don't go to church very often. But I haven't killed anyone. Okay? And let's say we give three scores to that. My average might be two out of three. Yeah. Let's take someone else. Billy comes to mind. Billy's a really good tipper. He tips 20% when he goes to restaurants. He was an altar boy when he was small, but he's just murdered someone in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> if you take a weighted average, yeah. Billy actually beats me. Right. And, and that's the danger of weighted average. It's a not, I, I would be looking to a non-linear system that really penalizes failure rather than averaging out uh, good things. Yeah, no, I, we, I mentioned that in the end of the slide that right now we're struggling with whether or not those weights are are appropriate or whether there's another more clever way to, to look at it. But the idea that I wanted to bring home to everyone is that I think this once you start thinking this way, you begin to have just what you're going through. How are we going to uh, produce a synthetic tool that is something that the council, councils can actually use that will be uh, acceptable to the group. And so it's just that conversation that I think needs to happen because I think it gets it out in the open. Okay, I'll let you go. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks, Sam, that was great. Uh, and I have to say that uh, never in my life have yeah. I taken notes at talks, and now there's been two talks and I took notes in both and it's really scaring me. Um, okay, so our next speaker in, a, in any forum about ecosystem fisheries management needs no introduction. <laughs> so, Was that a joke? <laughs> sort of, uh, but not really. So really, Christensen is our next speaker. My colleague Daniel Pauli was so upset when Ray Hilborn introduced him here. With that very introduction, so I'm not wondering if that's uh, <laughs> a habit here. I'm a partisan in the war that Jake Rice was talking about. And I've been back for the last couple of decades. The war is not over yet, or the revolution is not won yet. Uh, during these couple of 20 years, it must be now, I've been working quite dumb, predominantly excuse my bad English, I'm the Dane uh, transplanted. I've been working predominantly with development, support of an ecosystem-based management tool called Ecopart, Ecopart with Ecosim and, and other names, EWE. And uh, this is a tool that has developed a lot over the years. And by now we're talking about, I don't know, six, 7,000 registered users, 150 countries, so it's had an enormous impact on describing ecosystems, what we know about, especially tropic flows and how we would exploit ecosystems, and also on analysis and predictions related to that. I'm not going to be talking too much about the past though, but I'll be talking much more about what we are having fun with now. And uh, just by means of introduction, this is uh, one of my bragging slides. Um, from Noah's 200 years anniversary, we were really very, was very happy to see that uh, they recognized Ecopart for its simplicity and its use. Um, it's one of the 10 major scientific breakthroughs in 200 year history. That's, that's quite something, isn't it? Well, um, <laughs> I wonder what happened 100 years ago. They must be, they must be forgotten by now. But uh, in any case, we, this modeling has developed a lot over the years, and those of you who looked at it 10, 15 years ago, let me just tell you, it's not your grandfather's model anymore, not the old 4T, but there has been a lot of development with it. Very noticeably, we have been challenging the models a lot in recent years, and this has led to looking at how we can reproduce the history of the ecosystems with these ecosystem models. And we found that's actually quite feasible. It's even feasible without adding the hundreds of uh, Jake, 
jet lagged. He's jet lagged. I was just going to give a reference to you. Adding the hundreds of parameters that are due to assessment models, that's not necessarily what we do here. There's not that many. But we found that we can use these models to produce very credible fit, credible fit to all of this data that we have of all the various resources in the system. It actually works pretty well. We can also use the model to make plausible policy predictions. And a very important conclusion from this is that in order to do so, we need to, in, to include not just fisheries effects, but also the system productivity effects, the environmental effects, what we get from the climate models, what we get from the hydrography models. We cannot do this without having both of these very important factors covered. That is, nece that is necessary. It's actually a major finding in the sense that it, needs, it means it's necessary for us to work across the fields, not just with the fisheries, but we need to look at what happens with the environment as well, just like we need to look at what happens on the human side. More about that. Now, this is just to illustrate that it's not your grandfather's model again. The procedure we're using are very similar. This is for you, Andrew, actually. With, uh, with this model. It's, it's very similar to what's done in single species assessment. As such, it has moved quite a bit. Now, I mentioned there were lots of people using these models, and uh, this year is responses three years ago to a questionnaire that a PhD student at the Fisher Center sent out. Gives you 325 models, and it's, very in it's incomplete. We've all probably talking about 500. Now, out of these, about 30% said they were using these models for fisheries management. That's quite a large number of cases. However, using the models for fisheries management or making them for fisheries management don't mean that they are actually applied to fisheries management. And I've been looking at cases I could find where the ecosystem models actually were integrated into a fisheries management. And I'm hard pressed to find 20 cases. Now, that's not because I'm not good at looking. I probably know many of them. It's more likely because that's the status. We haven't had that great impact on the actual fisheries management with the ecosystem modeling. And that's not just a question of EWE or EcoPark. That goes for any kind of ecosystem modeling that is the, yeah, the revolution is not one yet. That's what it boils down to. There are many reasons for that. And one of the reasons is clearly we don't have enough experience with how we do this. We've seen some great advances there in, in the last talk, but still, we are, we are, we are still jumping a little bit in, in the dark here. And one important aspect of, of that is that if we disregard places like uh, some of those who hear the talks here, fisheries management is not EB. That's a new acronym for you, Andre. It's not ecosystem based. It's not there yet. But we also heard that scientists communicate quite differently from the policymakers and the public. And uh, one question that we, I think here, as I can say as scientists, because most of us are, like to be scientists, is um, the one question we can raise is, uh, raise is actually, do we provide the information that's actually needed by the people who make the decisions, be they the politicians or the public? And also, do we communicate the science in a comprehensible form for people? Now, that's, uh, that's the area we are moving into now in the development of these models. We're doing a train mode, and I'll talk to you more about how we do it. But this here is a room we have at the Fisher Center called the Scenario Lab. And it's uh, designed for management purposes. The idea here is bring a group of managers together around the table. And uh, you can think of this a little bit like the war rooms that they must have in Pentagon. You know, before you go into a new country, you just try out what happens, how many people are going to lose, and when can you declare mission accomplished, that kind of activity. <laughs> now, wouldn't it be great to do something like that for fisheries management as well? Now, that's the kind of games we play in this room here. And we've been developing the tools to support that decision support process. And uh, let me show you some of that in, I think, the coming slides. Really what we're trying to do is to get not just the people who sit in the Fisheries Council, but maybe the ministers as well, 
to tell them about our illogical science. Because you have to admit that it doesn't make much sense, does it? That you buy more boats, you send out more boats. Okay, you want more fish, but you don't get more fish. That makes perfect sense to people here, I'm sure. But uh, not to the economists. Um, there must be economists here, but not to the average economist who knows very much that well, supply is demand driven. It is not a very logical science we have in the, in, from that perspective. So we look, we are addressing those questions. And um, what we're doing is developing an approach which we uh, base on the best available science and which can be used to make realistic simulations of what will happen to this ecosystem, what will happen to the social and economical aspects of that in the future. This is not an easy task, but we have a, we've got a nice team here that is working with this, and what I'm talking about now is a four-year project funded by Olympus Ocean Futures, the Olympus Ocean, Ocean Program. Uh, we are a little bit more than two years into it, so I'm not going to be talking about what it is we want to do, but more about what it is we have done already. This is the procedure we have set up for this approach. It's, a, it's an MSE procedure. We have an, an operating model over here. And as, as I stressed when I talked about how we fit in the models, we need to incorporate these, the effects from, from, of the system productivity. We bring that into an ecosystem model which has a value chain 